Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Wilson, and we are ready to get started with tonight's webinar. Um, first of all, we just wanted to welcome our listeners who um, prefer to hear the webinar tonight in French. And if that is um, your preference as well, I just wanted to point out that at the bottom of the screen, there is a little interpretation button and you can click that um, to go over into the room with Dorothy, our um, translator for the evening. So with that, we are ready to get started. And I just want to welcome everyone to our uh, last virtual education uh, session of 2020, Anxiety and Depression in Children with Rheumatic Diseases. We know there are so many difficult stages of juvenile arthritis or any rheumatic disease for a child and family. And it's sometimes hard to know when things are just that hard or when extra support is needed. And we hope tonight's webinar will give you some important information about that, uh, as well as the chance to um, meet other families who are also affected. And as you can see on our screen, we have um, actually over 120 registrations tonight um, from right across Canada, as well as internationally, who are tuning in um, to participate in this session and learn more from our expert speakers. We, uh, at this point, just want to encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat function below. Um, you're welcome to tell us who you are, where you're attending from, a little bit about your story if you like, and also let us know if you're watching with others in uh, your family or, or if you're also watching with the youth who's affected as well. Um, it'd be so great to get just a sense of everyone who's on the line tonight as we um, talk about our speakers. So before we go into that, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about Cassie and Friends. As I mentioned, my name is Jennifer. I'm the executive director of Cassie and Friends. And Cassie and Friends is an organization that's 100% focused on kids and families affected by juvenile arthritis and other rheumatic diseases in Canada. And we're really excited to work hand in hand with pediatric rheumatology teams, so your nurses, doctors, allied health workers, therapists, et cetera, right across Canada to try and provide kids and families um, with uh, some of the answers and, and ways to support them through the day-to-day -day challenges of juvenile arthritis, as well as other rheumatic diseases like childhood lupus, juvenile dermatomyositis, SGIA, and more. So if we go to the next slide, um, we never forget that well, uh, we are here to support kids and families every day. We have a deep seated belief that no child should have to suffer the pain of arthritis. And so our vision is a pain free future for all kids. And that is why we also fund, lead and participate in very important research um, that's going to advance these conditions forward in our community. We want to thank our series sponsors. Um, this has been an, an interesting year and a, a mental health webinar couldn't be more timely. Um, obviously, there are many challenges associated with juvenile arthritis and rheumatic disease. And in a year where there is a worldwide pandemic, obviously, we're seeing all sorts of other stressors, worries, anxieties, isolation as well. And so I just want to say a special thank you to Nicola Wealth, Avi, Amgen, Roche and Sovi um, for not just making this webinar possible. Um, they've also helped us produce five other uh, special expert led webinars in uh, 2020. And if we go to the next slide, um, you can see Juvenile Arthritis uh, 101, UVitis, a youth panel. Um, we've also had a teen transition webinar. And what's really exciting to me about these webinars is not just to bring people together live online, but we've also created um, a special spot on our website where we've recorded all of the question and answers um, with the support of our medical advisory committee. So expert um, information, advice, and, and things you don't always get a chance to ask in clinic. Um, so please do check out our cassieandfriends.ca forward slash virtual education um, website and uh, check out some of the FAQ there as well as see any past recordings you might have not had a chance to see. 
Okay, so a few housekeeping notes. Um, one is I just want to let everyone know that your mics are muted. So don't worry about that while we're uh, watching the webinar. Um, if you have technical difficulties or if you're unable to uh, use the Zoom function, we just wanted you to know that we also have dial-in available. So you can just listen by phone and you can find that information in your registration email or in the reminder that went out yesterday. And finally, I think such an important part of these expert led webinars is not just receiving the information, but is the chance to interact with our experts, as well as our patient speakers. So if you have a question tonight, um, you will see below. Uh, I know some of you I can see are using the chat function to introduce yourself, but there's actually a Q&A button as well. So during the session, anytime, if you have a question, feel free to put it in that box. Um, and then you can also wait until after the session. We also have all of the questions that were received during registration. So we will do our best to get through all of those questions. And for those we don't get to during the session, you can email us at infoandcassianfriends.ca and we will also follow up as best as we can to make sure that everyone here gets answers to their questions tonight. Lastly, uh, I know some of you saw in our reminder email, we really encourage you to keep the conversation going. Cassie and Friends uh, in 2020 was very, very excited to launch the first safe and secure online support network for parents of children with rheumatic disease. We have approximately 80 members now that are accessing not just the chance to check in, share experiences, ask questions, um, which are often answered by our medical advisory committee, but also the chance to use some uh, really interesting tools in there like our pain tracker, medication tracker, etc. So I really encourage you um, to access the online support network and um, to start building your own support network, which I think we'll hear later in this webinar is so important, not just to your child's mental health, but yours as well as a caregiver. Okay, so it's time to get started. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker today, Kayla Caddy. Kayla is a patient. She grew up with juvenile arthritis symptoms at the age of 12, but her journey to diagnosis actually took much longer. She grew up in Port Alberni, which is a small town in Northern Vancouver Island. Um, and today she is working towards her bachelor in psychology at the University of Victoria. Kayla is here to share her story, but also provide some tips for parents, family members, youth, and even healthcare professionals about their role in helping youth to not just survive, but to thrive with their condition. And with that, I'm really excited to um, pass it over to Kayla Caddy. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to everyone else who's here this evening. I know that most of you here have a child with juvenile arthritis. And the first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you so much for being here to learn how to support your children. Having supportive parents means the world to chronically ill kids. And you being here right now means that you truly want to support them the best way that you can. As Jennifer said, my name is Kayla Caddy and I have juvenile arthritis. My story isn't an, isn't an uncommon one for people with invisible illnesses. Um, I was about 12 years old when my right knee started hurting. I was athletic. I played on a competitive softball team and an all-female all hockey team and a zombie school's basketball team. Being an athlete was part of my identity. After a month or so of my knee hurting, my mom took me to our family doctor who did a quick assessment and decided it was growing pains or a sprain, classic. <laughs> he told me to take a couple of days off from my sports and then I should be good to go again. Well, that didn't exactly happen. The next few years were filled with doctors telling me that they didn't know what was causing my pain and fatigue. I saw many different doctors, but none of them could help me. I eventually dropped out of hockey and basketball because they were just too tough on my joints and my fatigue was so debilitating. I hated having to play those, having to stop playing those sports, but I was happy I could still play softball. However, by the time I was 16, I had to make the hardest decision of my life so far to quit softball. It was literally my life. <laughs> I remember the very last game that I ever played. My team made it to provincials that year. We got the silver medal. I was so excited. And then I went home and I took off my cleats and my jersey for the last time. <laughs> At that point, I was pretty depressed, but I didn't want anybody to know. I felt like there is no hope for my life. 
if I couldn't even play the sport that I'd have been involved in since I was four years old, how could I ever actually be happy again? Maybe that sounds a bit overdramatic, but I didn't just lose softball that year. I also lost most of my friends. They all went back to playing the next year and I was left behind. I very quickly <laughs> became the kid that sat in their science classroom at lunch instead of being out in the schoolyard with my friends. All while this was happening, things at home were a bit tense. My mom didn't know how to help me. She had brought me to many doctors and physiotherapists and they were all telling us that they couldn't figure out what was wrong. I don't blame her for not knowing what to do. My symptoms were vague and my blood tests were coming back clear. So wasn't I fine? I was angry and I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. So getting upset and taking it out on my mom was an easy way. <laughs> At that point, I had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, patellofemoral pain syndrome, and fibromyalgia. The treatment I was given for each of these were antidepressants and a knee brace. Not very helpful. During my teenage years, I actually ended up being prescribed many different antidepressants. Um, I didn't give them much of a try though, because I was worried about the stigma. I didn't want to take them. I felt like if I did take them, then I would be giving in and admitting that the pain and fatigue were all in my head like the doctors were saying, that I was a faker. But my pain and fatigue were so real. But so was the depression and anxiety. I felt like I was drowning. I was angry at the world, angry at my family, but even more angry at my own body. Why was it so messed up? I hated it. Why did it hurt all the time? It wasn't fair and it honestly still isn't fair. Somehow in the midst of all that, I graduated from high school. I was excited, but I was also terrified. How in the world would I walk that far from class to class? Walking down the halls of my high school was hard enough, let alone like across a full campus. What would happen if my health got worse and I was three hours away from home without my mom to reassure me that things were gonna be okay? And also how the heck do you make a doctor's appointment yourself? I had never had to do that so far. <laughs> Not too long into my first year of university though, my pain did get a lot worse. My ankles, back, wrists, hands, everything started hurting. And I was really struggling with keeping up. I missed so many classes in that first year because I, I just couldn't do them. I ended up seeing a doctor at the university health clinic. And after seeing her a couple of times, she decided to run some tests that no one had checked yet. Less than a week later, I got a call saying that my CRP and ANA were very high and that she was referring me to a rheumatologist. Most people would be frightened by such news, but honestly, I was so ecstatic. <laughs> I could finally see a glimmer of hope again. Somebody actually listened to me and knew what to look for. I just, I was excited. <laughs> At that point, it had been almost seven years since the onset of my symptoms, and I had to wait another nine months to see a rheumatologist. It felt like the longest nine months ever. <laughs> but after that first appointment, I left and I immediately went to my car and just cried. But they were happy tears. I had a diagnosis and a treatment plan and that was the most hopeful I have felt since I was 12 years old. That first appointment was three years ago now. And I can't say that everything is sunshine and rainbows. It certainly, certainly is quite cloudy some days still but I can say that I am a lot more hopeful for my future now. I'm now in my final year of my undergraduate degree. I decided to major in psychology. <laughs> I still struggle a lot with my anxiety and depression as well as a lot of medical trauma. I am terrified of doctors. After eight years of being misdiagnosed and told that I was faking my symptoms, I still have a lot of anger and hurt in me, but I'm slowly healing. Each positive interaction I have with a medical professional makes that anger and, and hurt dissipate just like a tiny little bit. <laughs> there are still times when all I can do is lay in bed and cry. Sometimes I take a day or two off from work because I know that I'm on the verge of a breakdown. If I don't take a break, I'm not going back in for a while. But I've learned skills to, kill, I've learned skills to cope with these feelings. I'm now on antidepressants. I've actually given them a shot this time <laughs> and they're working quite well. I've also been seeing a therapist on and off for a couple of years now to work through my mental struggles. I live with my partner who is so incredibly supportive. He knows how to help me when my joints are flaring, how to calm me down when my anxiety is getting crazy again. He knows when I stop laughing at his jokes, it's not just him, it's my depression acting up.
I also have several amazing friends who are my rocks. They let me cry on their shoulders whenever I need to. We get ice cream and cry about how, unlife, how unfair life is quite often. My mom and I have a better relationship now as well. I'm working on being more open and honest with her and she definitely tries to listen more. We've both learned so many invaluable lessons over the past 10 years. I also met a lot of people in online support groups who have similar stories to mine. And it's so, so refreshing to have people to talk to that know what I'm experiencing. They know the toll that frequent tests and self injections and pain take on a person. The world feels a lot less lonely, lonely now. I guess the moral of my story is to listen. Parents, listen to what your kids are saying and make sure that they know how much you care about what they're telling you. You don't have to have some intricate speech prepared to let them know that you're on their side. Just tell them that you love them and hold them tight and tell them that you'll do whatever you can to help them get through this difficult time. Being a kid with a chronic illness is so incredibly tough, but having a supportive family can make the biggest difference even if they seem a bit angry at you at the time. And teens, don't be afraid of seeking help for your mental health. You're going through a lot, so, so much. And experiencing depression or anxiety is totally okay. It is not your fault and it's okay to ask for help. Going to therapy or taking antidepressants are not things you should feel ashamed of. You should be proud of yourself for taking care of your emotional health. Mental health is just as important as physical health, and we, did, and we need to start talking about it some more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kayla. I, you're, that was amazing. <laughs> I felt both uh, emotional and so inspired, and um, I hope everyone is watching the chat because I, I feel like Kayla's story is doing what is so important to Cassie and friends and that's in that chat there's not just um, relating happening there's sharing happening and um, encouragement um, it, and it's just amazing and it, it's really what we try and do because we do believe that um, like Kayla said that support network is so important um, and I think another thing you said Kayla that just spoke to me um, so deeply was just that 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 whole point about just being believed. And, and, and I think that's such an important thing that you can work with your healthcare team, your child, um, and, and potentially um, someone like our next speaker um, to really ensure your child is just feeling validated in whatever they're experiencing. So thank you so much, Kayla. And with that, I'm really excited to um, introduce our expert speaker for tonight. Uh, Dr. Penny Sneddon is a registered psychologist. She's also the director of Cornerstone Child and Family Psychology Clinic, uh, as well as a trusted um, psychologist at BC Children's Hospital who has worked closely with the pediatric rheumatology team there. Um, and perhaps most specially, uh, Dr. Sneddon has been a really uh, valued member of the Cassie and Friends community. She has uh, offered insight and her expertise at our past family days. And with all the news of, of the vaccines that I know everyone is feeling um, hopeful and positive about, we're very excited to um, look forward to connecting in person again. Tonight, though, we're very lucky to have Dr. Snedden coming to us um, from her home in Vancouver to share some more information about rheumatic diseases and how they might affect your child, both emotionally and mental health-wise. Penny. Hi, well, thank you. Oops. Can you hear me? All right. It's a, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, with Cassie and friends. And I'm always amazed at the turnout and the community that, that has been formed here. And it, it's truly amazing. And thank you, Kayla, for sharing about your experiences. I think, unfortunately, your story highlights some of the challenges that all too often occur in one's diagnostic journey and also when living with a chronic health condition. So thank you for being such a mental health advocate and a role model. So I'm going to build on what Kayla has talked about, and I'm hoping that there's a few takeaways from today. So first, I hope that you leave today with a basic understanding about what we know the research says about living with a chronic health condition. 
And specifically, I'm gonna talk some about rheumatic disease as well. I want you to leave with a good awareness of some of the common mental health challenges that uh, children and youth with rheumatic diseases experience, both what to look out for and also if you are seeing it in your ch child or in your teen or in yourself, some of the best evidence-based interventions for how to address those concerns. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about some of my go-to resources. So next slide. So let, let's actually dig into some of the research and I'm just gonna cover this pretty briefly. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, when we look at emotional well-being in children with chronic health conditions, the research shows that children with chronic, chronic medical conditions are two times as likely as those without a chronic medical condition to have mental health challenges. Now, in these studies, they oftentimes, uh, we can actually go back a little bit. In these studies, they actually go back and they uh, look at chronic health conditions in clusters. And so you're gonna have a lot of different chronic medical conditions involved in those studies. And, but even when I think about rheumatic diseases, whether we're talking about different rheumatic conditions and or whether we're even talking about individuals with the same diagnosis, we know that everybody experiences different types of symptoms, different severities of symptoms, and the impact on their day-to-day -day can actually vary really significantly. So when we talk about the research, let's keep in mind that we're talking about group data and keep in mind that your child is unique. They come with their own set of circumstances, their own strengths, as well as their own challenges. So a substantial amount of research has been done looking at psychological ad adjustment and coping of children with uh, JIA. And the research findings that I'm gonna briefly review today, they focus a lot on JIA. And this is for a couple of reasons. One, we know JIA is the most common rheumatic disease in childhood. And second, we, we actually have more research on JIA. So it's easier to make some conclusions versus with some of the other rheumatic diseases, we actually just don't have enough research. It's like kind of a study here and there, but not enough to really come to any significant conclusions. When we do look at psychological functioning in children and youth with JIA, uh, there's a lot of variability in the findings. There is a recent review that looks at um, a number. I think they included 60 different studies and they found that uh, children or youth with JIA actually show symptoms of depression and anxiety at similar rates as other children who have chronic health conditions. They do show higher rates, however, compared to their same aged peers who don't have a chronic health condition. So just to summarize, so similar rates to other kids or youth who have chronic health conditions, but higher rates compared to peers who don't have chronic health conditions. So in conclusion, we know that many children with JIA actually function really well emotionally, very similar to their peers. However, they are at increased risk to experience social emotional concerns such as anxiety, depression, or lowered quality of life. Studies looking at mental health in childhood onset lupus report that around 20% report significant symptoms of anxiety or depression, and that they're at increased risk for suicidal ideation or those thoughts of harming oneself. Next slide. Actually, you're on the right slide. <laughs> I lost control of my clicker. It, it's really hard. <laughs> uh, when we're looking at school adjustment, and specifically school adjustment in children and teens with JIA, what we know is from the research is that children with JIA report having higher rates of school absenteeism, with some studies showing that up to 50% of children reporting prolonged school absences because of their medical condition. And not surprisingly, more significant JIA symptoms are predictive of higher rates of missed school days. And because we know school isn't just about the academics, it's also, there's a big social component. It's really important to look at that. And generally, what we're finding is that teens and children with JIA report sufficient support from friends, or if they're in romantic relationships, sufficient support from, from those relationships as well. So let's look at long-term psychological adjustment. So when we're looking generally at youth 
with chronic health conditions. So again, clustering them together and their long-term psychological adjustment and functioning, there's actually some research to suggest that they have lower rates of achievement in some of those really important young adult milestones. So these might include moving out of their parents' house, finding a job, graduating from, from university. But it should be noted that there's a lot of factors that play into these outcomes, um, including but not limited to the duration that they'd experienced the, the illness. When we look specifically at long-term psychosocial impact in JIA, uh, we know that individuals with JIA report more impaired physical functioning, but the research is a little bit mixed as far as psychosocial functioning. With regards to emotional functioning, some studies suggest that uh, long-term emotional functioning is very similar to those of, peer, of their peers, while others suggest increased uh, rates of anxiety and depression. There's also several studies that look at academic achievement and spousal relationships and show no difference between uh, individuals with JIA and their peers. There are some mixed findings about employment levels with some evidence suggesting that employment rates are lower in individuals with JIA compared to their peers. So taken together, uh, I, and I think Kayla said this so beautifully, it really becomes apparent that one of the best things we can do for our youth with, with rheumatic disease is really taking a holistic approach, not only focusing on their physical health, but also on the emotional impact of having a chronic health condition. And so this might include focusing on good coping, you know, expression of emotions, as well as setting developmentally appropriate goals. We also know that having a child with a chronic health condition not only impacts that individual, but it can impact the family. Parents oftentimes report lower quality of life and increased distress. And this oftentimes increases um, during times when their child is more symptomatic. Um, these stressors oftentimes relate to the disease and they can include worries about their child's future, the disease course, academics, management of the disease, maybe it's even missed time from work or the financial burden that results from that. We also can't forget about siblings in all of this because they can also be potentially impacted. It's not uncommon for siblings to report emotional distress. And this can include a variety of things. It could be guilt about not having the medical condition, worry about getting the medical condition, time lost with friends or with family, because we know life is really busy when you have a child with a chronic health condition. And, and quite honestly, it's really hard to find time to attend to all of your children's needs. So let's talk about some takeaways from the research. We know that one, a lot of children with JIA and other rheumatic diseases function as well as peers, socially, emotionally, and academically but they are at increased risk for both short-term and long-term psychosocial concerns. Uh, some of the factors that we know can contribute include disease severity, as well as um, we also know that family cohesion can be a real protective factor. And Kayla, I think you actually mentioned that in, in, your, in your talk. Caregivers are also at risk for increased caregiver burden. And we can't forget about siblings because they're, they can be negatively impacted as well. Generally, more study is needed. I think you probably noticed, I said there's mixed results. We don't have enough on this. And I think more study is especially needed when we're talking about some of those less common rheumatic diseases. So not surprisingly, based on what I just covered. We have some common presenting challenges. Um, these are based in the research and also just what I experienced clinically. Uh, some of the common presenting challenges include anxiety, low mood or depression, uh, pain management, as well as treatment compliance, which we know can range in rheumatic diseases, ranging from like taking medications to doing their physio. 
And I'm going to talk more about these challenges specifically and what they might look like, because you as caregivers and healthcare providers really are going to be the most likely people to identify when there's a problem and connecting our, our children or youth to supports. So let's talk about anxiety. So anxiety in children and youth with rheumatic disease, they can be both disease specific or they can be more general in nature. So some examples of disease specific anxieties might be procedural anxiety, uh, such as needle phobia with injections or getting their blood work done. They could be health related worries. This might include worries about having a flare, uncertainty about the course of the symptoms or the prognosis, feelings of loss of control, kind of you, you can't trust your body anymore. There can also be worries about the consequences of disease. You know, am I going to be able to go and do this fun school activity? Am I going to be able to even attend school? Am I going to be able to go and hang out with my friends? There can also be a lot of social worries uh, related to the disease, such as how and if I should even talk to my friends about what I'm going through. Will people understand or will they think that I'm faking? We also know that some rheumatic diseases are more visible than others, and this can lead to worries about appearance. And there can also be a lot of anxiety about medical traumas, and this can be about medical procedures themselves, or it can be about negative experiences with the medical system. There can also be some non-specific uh, anxieties. This might include social anxiety, separation anxiety, or school refusal, uh, panic symptoms, phobias, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is marked by really sticky thoughts and engaging in compulsive behaviors to try to decrease the anxiety that comes along with those sticky thoughts. It can also include general worries. And these could be worries about you know, your safety, your parents' safety, their health, about dying. Uh, oftentimes, this is when perfectionism comes into play, worries about the future, having a really hard time dealing with uncertainty. They kind of need things to be, you know, one way and anything outside of that way, it's really hard to adapt to. Next, let's talk about depression. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And oftentimes, this, is, this can be a tricky one with kids and with teens, because oftentimes kids and teens aren't coming to you as caregivers or to their healthcare team saying, oh, I feel so sad, or I'm feeling so depressed. And we know that in children and teens, depression can look many different ways. So there might be an increase in irritability or anger, increase in moodiness, there might be persistent sadness or feelings of hopelessness or worthlessness, or you might see your child having excessive guilt over everything. You might also see that they just don't seem to enjoy things that they used to enjoy or changes in behavior, like they might be more withdrawn. Uh, you might see an increase in clinginess, especially when they're young. They might show increased behavioral challenges like increase in defiance or those temper tantrums that are so fun to deal with. Or that you might see changes in their energy level, their appetite or their sleep patterns. So it's not uncommon for us to hear kids complain about difficulties with memory, attention, concentration, or difficulties with making de uh, tough decisions when they're feeling a low mood, and they might have an increase in suicidal ideation, so those thoughts of uh, self-harm, or actually engage in self-harm, which can look like cutting, scratching, um, burning. Lastly, you might see an increase, we'll go back to that slide, you might also see an increase in physical symptoms, um, and these might be those disease-specific symptoms that they commonly have with their rheumatic condition, or it could be other things that aren't necessarily associated to that. So um, it's not uncommon for there to be an increase in stomach aches or headaches. So you know your child best. And it, while it's important to be aware of these red flags, 
you also kind of have to pay attention to your gut feeling. If you feel like something's off, check in with your, with your child or your teen. Checking in does not increase the rates of those symptoms. And also it's okay to reach out to your medical team for some support and guidance as well. With many rheumatic conditions, pain symptoms is a big piece of this and it, it, can, it can be really stressful. And we also know that chronic pain and psychological distress, the, with, with chronic pain, there comes to psychological distress and the pain causes distress, which then in turn can contribute to mood and anxiety symptoms, which then in turn can amplify pain symptoms. So there's really this reciprocal relationship between pain and emotional distress, and they both impact one another and they're really hard to, to tease apart. Treatment adherence is another big one that it can be a common challenge. And I think every single person here can testify that having a chronic health condition is a burden. And oftentimes it requires our children and our teens and quite frankly, us as parents to do exactly what we don't wanna do or what our body is screaming at us not to do, to do their physio when they, when they have a lot of pain or when they feel super fatigued, to take their medication regularly, to do the injections, to go to school when they feel crummy. And it's a lot. And I think that sometimes when it gets overwhelming, they just, they just wanna be done. And this is when we oftentimes see issues with treatment adherence or not following those medical recommendations. And in my practice, oftentimes I find it's not because they don't know what to do or how to do it. It's more just because they wanna break. They just wanna be done with it. Um, so I think it's really important to identify that interplay between disease, the symptoms, the symptom burden on emotional distress and how these kids manage their conditions. I'm gonna skip this next slide because I'm gonna talk a little bit about it at the end. And I wanna actually go to talking about treatment. So that next slide. So we have a pretty good idea of what to look out for. Now let's talk about what to do if you see that your child is struggling. And I, I also saw that we actually do have some teens here. So also if you're struggling. So we know that there's some general things that children with chronic health conditions and their families can do to promote emotional well-being. The first one is to gain knowledge. So it's important for both caregivers as well as the children and youth to understand the medical condition. Knowledge can be super empowering and it can make it all seem a little bit less scary and it can give people a sense of control. And I think what oftentimes gets lost is that knowledge and gaining knowledge is an ongoing process. So it shouldn't stop at the time of diagnosis. And as kids and reach teens to young adults, their understanding is gonna change. And so it's really important to check in periodically and fill in any sort of gaps that might be there. We also know that learning stress management can be key. So stress is just a part of life. It's not gonna go anywhere. It's always gonna be around. And sometimes if you can figure out and do some effective problem solving uh, with your kids around stress management, it's one of, the, one of the best gifts that you can give them, quite frankly. And we also know a big part of this as parents is us modeling effective stress management as well as self-care. Um, this often requires us to kind of go back to the basics and setting our children and our youth up for success by helping them to get adequate sleep, having some routine and some schedules, eating regularly. We also want to normalize life as much as possible. And at sometimes this might be easier than others, but we want, we want kids to be doing kid things and teen things. We want them hanging out with their friends, going to school as much as possible. We also know that parents, one of the best things you can do is also uh, continue to parent, have really clear expectations for your teens, for your children. Uh, set limits, provide opportunities for independence and decision making. And lastly, connect with people. And the fact that you're here, you have your community. I find sometimes parents connecting with other parents who just get it, kids connecting with other kids who just get it, it can be extremely helpful. So let's talk a little bit about treatment for anxiety and depression. 
uh, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy, which is oftentimes called CBT, and medication have been found to be effective treatments for both anxiety and depression. Uh, CBT, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like. It can be used in combination with medication or in isolation. And we know that long-term outcomes, the therapy piece, the CBT piece is super essential because oftentimes some of the effects, the benefits of the medication might dissipate if you stop taking the medication. But if you have the skills to know how to manage anxiety, stress, uh, mood symptoms, then those are gonna be much longer lasting. We also know that medication uh, is associated with significant improvements in anxiety and mood, and it can be used also alone or in combination with CBT. What, what we tend to do, CBT is generally the first line of treatment. If we find that kids are not benefiting from the treatment as much as we would expect, if they're putting in a lot of effort, they're doing kind of all the quote unquote right things and they're just not getting the benefit, that might be when we explore medications. Um, oftentimes I find, and what we know from research is that CBT alone can be extremely effective for those mild uh, anxiety and depression. It's when it reaches that moderate to severe, then it also, then adding that adjunct medication is when it can sometimes be effective. That said, I see a lot of people with moderate to severe anxiety or depression who do really well with CBT alone. So it really is kind of an individual basis. So let's talk a little bit about how anxiety and depression work. We know that both anxiety and depression affect one's thoughts, their body, and their affect, as well as their behaviors. So for example, if I'm feeling really worried, I might experience symptoms of a racing heart, an upset stomach. Um, I, I experience stress in my shoulders, like I'm gonna get a headache, uh, sweating, shaking, or worrying. We know that depression also has physical symptoms and oftentimes people talk about muscle aches, headaches, fatigue, sleep problems, changes in appetite when they're feeling depressed. We know that anxiety and depression also impact thoughts. And so this might include overly negative thinking about themselves, about the world, about their future, or worried thoughts such as like, what if this? What if this happens? What if this happens? And usually it's worst case scenario. It also might include some attentional bias where there's an over-focus on the not great things that are happening and forgetting to think about other possibilities or explanations. Lastly, we know that anxiety and depression impact behavior. So for example, with anxiety, it, avoidance is strong kids, teens, adults, we don't wanna do things with that cause us to have high distress levels or anxiety levels. So this might be avoiding getting blood work done because of the fear of needles, avoiding doing physical activity because they're worried about pain worsening. It could be afraid of going to school or worries about social judgment. Children with anxiety also ask a lot of reassurance seeking questions. Am I gonna be okay? What's gonna be happening? Did I do this right? Are you mad at me? And with these reassurance seeking questions, oftentimes the more reassurance seeking or reassurance that we give these kids, our kids, then oftentimes the questions just keep asking. It doesn't seem to put them at bay. We also know that depression impacts behavior. And these are some of those behaviors that we talked about when we were talking about the symptoms. It might be increased withdrawn behavior not talking about challenges, kind of going, internalizing their, those emotions, not seeing friends. For some, it's staying in bed all day, uh, not engaging in those activities that you, you used to enjoy. So we know, if we go to the next slide, we know that cognitive behavioral therapy is the gold standard for treatment for childhood anxiety and mood disorders. And in fact, it's actually been shown to be a very effective treatment for a wide range of problems, uh, including um, chronic pain, anger, self-esteem. 
And what CBT does is it targets those three primary areas. And I'm gonna just very, very briefly review these. So one area that it focuses on is, and we can go to the next slide, is uh, body symptom management. These might include techniques or skills such as progressive muscle relaxation, deep breathing, mindfulness, exercise, uh, imagery. And I think oftentimes people are like, oh, if I just take deep breaths, I won't feel as anxious. And by no means am I saying that people are gonna breathe themselves out of clinical anxiety. And instead, what we oftentimes use these skills for is that general stress management, which we know is so important when we're talking about um, our kids who are living with chronic health conditions. The next area that we target are those thought strategies. And as we discussed, when feeling anxious or depressed, thinking tends to be overly negative because it's completely focused on danger, threat, or hopelessness. We, we don't always see the whole picture and thoughts are usually not based on facts and they're usually not realistic. So an important component of CBT is one increasing awareness of some of those maladaptive thought patterns that come along with anxiety and depression and learning to challenge and replace those maladaptive thought patterns to be more realistic and helpful. And oftentimes people are like, oh, just think positive. Well, I'm not talking about thinking positive. I'm actually talking about being more realistic with our thinking. Uh, these strategies look very different depending on the child's developmental level. So if I'm working with a child who's six, seven, it's gonna be very basic versus it gets a little bit more in depth as we're working with teens, young adults and adults. The last area, and it's super important, is uh, changing behavior. Uh, for anxiety, because that avoidance strategy is so, or that avoidance kind of reaction is so strong, that what we want to do is we want to gradually have our teens, our kids face those situations that they fear the most. But we do this in a really gradual manner. So we're not going to throw them in the deep end when they can't swim. And instead, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with exposures that are less anxiety provoking. And then we're gonna gradually work to those higher level anxiety exposures. So I wanna look, talk a little bit about what this might look like, like using an example. So if we go to the next one, what we do is we create what we call this fear hierarchy. This is an example of a fear hierarchy that I did with a, a child that had a needle phobia, which I know is really common in this population. And so what we did is we started off with even just thinking about a needle, which was a three out of a 10 for anxiety, 10 being a lot of anxiety. And then we gradually increased to working toward getting blood work done. Now this increase, it happened over time. It required repeated exposure. So we started off with thinking about a needle. We moved to eventually having a needle in the room. Then we moved to getting all the blood work um, paraphernalia out and practicing giving mock needles to each other. We went to the clinic. We had the person who was going to draw the blood do mock needles. So there was a lot of practice involved. The one thing that's really important about exposure work is that our kids, our teens, adults, when you're working on it, need to stay in that feared situation long enough to experience the anxiety go down. Because oftentimes what happens is people don't think that they can handle the distress or the anxiety that comes along with it and or they, they feel like horrible things are going to happen. So we want to have some reparative experiences and them to experience that anxiety can be actually be low in these situations. Behavior change is also really important when we're talking about depression. Um, you may have heard about behavioral activation. This is a huge component. As we talked about earlier, uh, individuals with de depression oftentimes stop engaging in those activities that naturally bring them pleasure. Um, and so what we want to do is we actually want to activate. We want to give them some inertia, some momentum. 
oftentimes what this entails is coming up similar to the exposure hierarchy, but more of a behavioral activation hierarchy. And so it's really about doing something. So if you have somebody who is, you know, staying in bed a lot, having a hard time uh, getting going, then it might be, you know what, we're just going to work on getting dressed. And then we might work toward, I'm going to go up and have meals with my family. I'm going to get out of the house at least one time a day. And so what we're doing is we're just activating. And oftentimes we see that a little activation can actually um, serve as a mood enhancing uh, behavior. And then it leads to them engaging in further behavior. So just briefly, let's talk about uh, some self-help resources. So what we know from research is that CBT is most effective when it's uh, done with a trained mental health professional. However, for some, uh, looking at self-help can actually be extremely helpful. These are some of my go-tos. Anxiety Canada, if you haven't looked at it, it is a fantastic website, just super practical, has a parent section, has a teen section that's really teen friendly and easy to navigate. These bottom two books are more parent resources um, for how to support your, your child or your teen who has anxiety. The Dealing with Depression book, uh, workbook is for teens to take a look at. And if you feel like uh, getting more professional help is important, then each of the provinces, and, and my apologies about my ignorance because I've only been here in BC, but it's my understanding that each of the provinces have some publicly funded places that can offer therapy for here is the child and youth mental health. I did some quick Googling. It sounds like the names are pretty similar in each of the provinces. Um, also private psychologists are an option. And oftentimes if you just talk to your healthcare team, they know people who specialize in child and teens, as well as have experience in more of the medical psychology end. You can also look at your province's association of psychologists and they usually have um, areas of specialty where you can get some names as well. So just before I end, I just wanna talk about, you know, when should I get more help? Because we know that, you know, is it typical? Is it something that I need to be really worried about? Or is it something that maybe we can manage at our, in our home by ourselves? So generally, here's my three rules of thumb. If symptoms of anxiety or depression are significantly interfering with your child's or teen's functioning at home, at school, with peers, it might be important to get some help. If after learning and implementing some of these strategies, which today we just went over them very superficially, so you'd need to get more information, but your teen is still suffering or your child is still suffering after that, you should get some help. And or if the anxiety or depression or behavior concerns are actually interfering with your child's medical needs, then you should definitely get some help. But certainly, you know, Cassie and Friends offers this community and I'm sure that, you know, we have people from a variety of provinces and lean on each other because I find word of mouth for those professionals who can be really helpful, really, really great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sneddon. Um, that was just amazing. It was such a great overview. Um, and I think we have so many amazing questions coming in uh, that relate to the information you provided. And I know that um, access to psychological support can be, can be difficult for some of the families. Obviously, Cassie and Friends supports kids and families right across Canada. Um, but I definitely would just say that if this is something that is um, really hitting home for you and you're feeling like you need to, to look for more support to talk to your pediatric rheumatology team as a first point um, and then work from there. And, I, and as well, uh, Cassie and Friends uh, has been working with kids and families for uh, 10 plus years in Canada. And so I think a, a lot of the, the support mechanisms and connection that we provide also is a good place to start and just um, providing support to yourself uh, as a caregiver or or a patient and then thinking about your children and I know um, as I was listening to Dr. Sneddon talk I thought that was this amazing for any 
parent, um, whether that be for your child affected by rheumatic disease or the siblings in your family. And then with that, I'm so excited to get to our Q&A. Uh, and with that, I really want to uh, introduce uh, another speaker because at Cassie and Friends, um, one of the things that's so important to us is to provide general information that relates to your child with rheumatic disease, but also specific information. So with the intent of that, we invited um, Dr. Lori Tucker, who is a pediatric rheumatologist at BC Children's Hospital. Um, she's also a board founding member and board member of Cassie and Friends and a member of our medical advisory committee uh, here to help with some of the questions that um, veer out of some of the more general psychological approaches for children with rheumatic diseases and can help you with some of your questions about the interplay of medication, etc. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to invite everyone to turn your cameras back on. So Kayla, Penny, and Lori, um, if you will unmute yourselves and turn your cameras back on, I will start asking questions. Um, just want to make sure we have Lori joining us as well. I think we're all here. So I think for the first question, um, and just given that we have uh, so many families on the line, which is amazing, but also a really a big array of, of child age ranges. Um, one question that came up quite a few times, and I'm going to direct this to Penny to, to start, is how young can kids be when affected by depression. Um, some of the families are saying, I already see maybe some of these signs in my, my toddler age. And is, am, am I mistaken? Is that true? Um, and also just a little bit of clarity around sort of anxiety first versus depression. Yeah, I'm gonna first talk about depression because I think historically people have oftentimes viewed depression as not being present in very young children. However, there's some recent research that suggests that yes, of course, toddlers and children can experience depression. And again, I just kind of want to go back and reiterate that depression can look different in these kiddos. So again, they're not going to be coming to you and saying, oh, I feel so depressed. I feel so sad. And instead, it's probably going to be more of a reflection in their behavior. So that's when you might see that withdrawn behavior, um, loss of interest in activities that quite frankly, they used to find a lot of joy in and love. They might show increased behavioral challenges like that defiance or the tantrums. Um, sometimes we even see some regression in the behavior, which would be more of the clinginess, uh, maybe some sleep regression. And so, yes, absolutely it can. It happens at lower prevalence rates in those ages, but certainly it can happen. And the really good news, which I feel like I also want to make sure that we're focusing on that there's a lot that can be done. Um, and the nice thing is, is that early intervention we know can be really helpful. And oftentimes when we have kids coming in who are really young, a lot of the work actually happens with parents about how you can support uh, your child with anxiety or depression. And that's because we know that you are the people who are around your kids the most, you know them the best. And also you're, you're really the primary change agents for, for change. Uh, similarly, with anxiety, we see them in we see anxiety in toddlers all the time. And a lot of the work is with, with parents. Yeah, I think um, one, of, one of the hard things that also came up in the questions was just that, that like at the young age, the parents are almost detectives watching for these behavioral <laughs> changes. And then your child grows and you, you get into, um, you know, the fear of, and one of our um, questions, I said this specifically, like, I don't want to be a helicopter mom and dad. So I'm going to actually direct this question to Kayla. Um, and we had so many comments, Kayla, that just said how brave and amazing you are for sharing your story. So thank you again. Um, and the question was, did you ever find it hard to talk to your parents about your feelings during those beginning days? And I know you were 12 at that time. And, and also just any advice you have for parents who are wanting to move out of the detective stage into just supportive and not suffocating. Yeah, um, I definitely found it very hard to talk to my mom about things. Um, 
I think the biggest thing was something that Dr. Sten was talking about quite a bit there about how kids with chronic illnesses can quite can feel like like they're a burden a lot of the time. And that was definitely something that I experienced. And even though my mom never made any, you know, she like she never made me feel like that. It was kind of coming internally, right? Where I felt like I didn't want to add more to her plate. And it, then that made it difficult for her to support me because she didn't know what I needed because I wasn't telling her. <laughs> so then it kind of started the cycle where I felt like I couldn't talk to her and then she couldn't talk to me because I wasn't explaining things to her. And it made it really difficult. I think the biggest thing, my mom and I have kind of figured things out now and she lets me come to her when I need support now. Um, and I mean, it's different because I'm, I'm 22 now, so it's different than if you have a six or seven year old, but she trusts me that if, if I need her support, I will go to her um, instead of her constantly hovering over me and just like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? It is one thing that she does that I really like is that she will, like, if she knows that I'm on like an infusion medication, she'll quite often like message me the day of that and just be like, oh, how's it going? And just checking in like that, just like really simple, like, and then respect what they say. Like if they say, I don't want to talk about this, don't make them talk about it. That's kind of, that's the biggest thing I think is just kids with chronic illnesses have such little control over their body and their experiences. And so letting them have that one little bit of control is, is really important. <laughs> For sure, for sure. You know, that's so you just reminded me, Kayla, of I'll never forget this one parent who um, they had a son and I think he was around like nine or 10, but they said just asking him and I, Dr. Snedden brought this up and I think anger is such an important emotion to talk about because it can be so difficult to deal with, but he would get quite angry. And so they worked out this sort of mechanism where to gauge his pain or his mood level, they would literally just ask him to thumbs up or thumbs down. And that, you know, really worked for their family in yes. terms of um, yes. not pushing the boundary of asking him to talk and talk and talk about it, but they were able to know how he was feeling and ask him and communicate, but in a very, in a way that worked for him. And I think that's, that was, you know, part of what you were getting at as well. Um, so our next question, I'm going to actually I send think Dr. To, Tucker had something to say. As yeah, well. I'm, I'm sending our next question to Dr. Tucker actually right now. Okay. So I'm going to yeah. ask the question and then you can add on okay. that one. And, okay. answer. and that's, we're getting a, a ton of questions and more specifically about do the medications typically prescribed for, um, both juvenile arthritis and, and we do have families here, uh, affected by lupus, JDM, CRMO, et cetera, but do the, the medications typically prescribed contribute to mental health issues directly? So I'll get to that in a moment, but mm -hmm. I did want to pick up on what, um, what you were talking about in the last question. And the group or the part of things that are missing here that we haven't talked about is actually the pediatric rheumatology team. And so when, um, you know, if parents are having trouble assessing whether their child has anxiety or depression or there's some communication difficulties, um, what we try to do in the clinic is we either the physician or most often the nurses actually, or sometimes the physio and OT, um, sometimes they're the person that kids feel more comfortable talking with and they can um, help get some information um, in a non sort of confrontational way that is really helpful. And we try, particularly with adolescents, during the time when they keep coming to clinic, that's why we are asking parents to let us see kids for a few minutes by themselves. Because what that allows is that allows kids to have their own personal time to bring up issues like perhaps struggling or other issues that maybe they don't want to talk about when their parents are in the room. So I would just say that really the pediatric rheumatology team members can be really helpful to parents to try and get a better um, handle on, you know, what's going on with their kids. So that's one thing. Medication. So 
There are some medications that we prescribe for kids with rheumatic diseases that very clearly can impact behavior or uh, mental health. Um, for example, oral steroids. A lot of kids will receive steroids either when they are first diagnosed with arthritis or particularly when they're diagnosed with lupus or dermatomyositis. Um, and during that time, when kids are on higher dose of steroids, um, there can be labile mood, trouble sleeping, or even significant depression um, when we taper medication from high doses to lower doses. And we try and alert families about that to kind of watch out for that. Um, but this is why we don't like to use steroids over the long term if we can help it with kids with rheumatic diseases. I would say that there's really not a lot of evidence that some of the other medications that we use, particularly methotrexate, I think parents have questions about that. There's not a lot of evidence that methotrexate itself, the medication, can cause anxiety or depression. There's no question that the side effects that surround taking methotrexate and um, can be problematic, but the medication itself, probably not. And similarly for biologic medication, there's not a lot of evidence that um, these cause uh, mental health issues. And I would say, because I've been involved in some of the drug trials for biologics, and for parents, if you're not sure, but you know, but maybe they didn't even look, right? We didn't even look. There's a lot of attention paid in drug trials of um, biologic medications in kids on mental health issues. Like it's an area of special interest. So it's not, um, it's not discarded or not paid attention to. People look for it very, um, very specifically. Amazing. Thank you, Lori. And um, Kayla, I, I know that actually in terms of um, what Dr. Tucker was talking about in terms of the way your healthcare team can help uncover some of the areas you might be struggling, I know you had a very... Um, special relationship with, I think it was an OT or an occupational therapist. And um, we actually had a question about um, what were some of the most or the most helpful thing a healthcare professional said to you or helped you with? Yes, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I have an occupational therapist now that I absolutely love. She's amazing. I actually see her tomorrow. And that's like, when I see her, those are my favorite days. <laughs> um, but I think the most, the thing that's left the most impression on me in a positive way from a medical professional has been just when they directly just say, like, I will listen to whatever you have to say and kind of give you the idea that, like, they know that, like, I am the professional of my own body. Like, I know myself best. I've been living with this for 10 plus years now. And I appreciate that they have many more years of ex like medical experience than I do. But just when a doctor tells me, what do you want me to do? What do you want to see happen during this appointment? Because then it goes back to the like feeling like you're in charge of something. It's like I can, there's something that I can actually do. And, you know, whether the doctor agrees with what I'm saying or they suggest something else, just being able to have them listen very attentively to exactly what I say um, and to know that it's not just going in one ear and out the other <laughs> is yeah that's that's kind of the best and then just feeling like then when they just make me feel like I'm understood and that they care about not just like the physical symptoms but also like the emotional impact of having a chronic illness has as well um, that's something big because a lot of doctors I've found anyways, don't really ask about that. You usually go in, they're like, oh, how's your joint pain? How's your fatigue? Okay, good. They don't really ask like, oh, how are you coping with self-injections or how are you coping with not being able to do this or that? So like when they do actually just like ask about that, <laughs> it feels pretty great. <laughs> That's great. And I think, you know, I think um, parents will relate to that so much because I know the most popular post on our website is um, a mom uh, contributed an article that said it's just arthritis right and it was about her friends and family not necessarily believing or offering all these helpful positive tips that um, were maybe contradictory to her child's medical advice around her kids juvenile arthritis so I think when we think about that and then think about the team or or youth experience we just want to be 
believed and taken seriously. Um, so our next question is, I'm gonna direct it to Dr. Sneddon. Um, we cannot ignore uh, the situation at hand, which is COVID. Um, and we've had quite a few quite a few questions that just said like, there is a lot going on. Um, so one mom said, there's a lot going on. COVID, teenage hormones, and now disease. So they were recently diagnosed with anachylosing spondylitis. But her question was really about like, how do we cope with it? all and I think I think the question is it really a family strategy at this point yeah um thank you first of all for bringing that up I I debated about talking about it directly in my presentation but I figured it would come up in conversation anyways and you know as if living with a chronic health condition wasn't enough huh <laughs> let's throw on a pandemic on top of that and we know from the research that our kids and our adolescents have been impacted. Their mental health has been impacted by this. And so for some, like the social isolation has been really challenging. There's also a lot of losses that have come with this, whether it's you know going to school, having some of those milestone events like graduation. Um, we also know that I mean, I hear in my own practice a lot of worries about from the teens, from the kids about getting the virus, especially if they're on immunosuppressants because they're like, oh, am I immunosuppressed enough that I'm going to be significantly impacted because they hear the news? Uh, also, you know, how will my parents handle it if they get it? What about my grandparents? So, so there's some real legitimate concerns and stresses that come, come out of this. It's funny because I oftentimes, like I use humor a lot, which I don't know whether that's <laughs> good or not, but I oftentimes have the conversation with families that really they have been preparing for this pandemic for as long as their child has had a chronic health condition because all of the things that I talked about in my presentation, you know, getting accurate information, connecting with others, going back to the basics, those are what we have found to be really helpful for our, our teens, our children through the pandemic. And so it's really kind of going back to those things that have allowed them to cope well, or what they found helpful for the chronic health condition. I find those, those directly apply to the pandemic as well. But certainly, you know, the, sh the short term, the long term effects, we, we need to study these, we need to make sure that we're taking care of of the impact that this is having on everybody, including you as parents, because I actually don't want to leave caregivers out of this. You know, this is having a huge impact on, on parents as well. Absolutely. So maybe Lori, we'll just go right back to you. And I know you've done so much amazing work on our COVID site, providing up-to-date information about um, the risks and implication of COVID specifically to the pediatric rheumatic disease community. So Maybe first, um, if you just want to provide what the research says in terms of the risk factor for kids with rheumatic disease and COVID. Well, um, what we know, and um, I will preface this by saying is this is what we know on December 14th, right. <laughs> might be different <laughs> in three days, um, is at least having a rheumatic disease, just having a rheumatic disease does not increase your risk of catching COVID. Um, and it likely, particularly if you have arthritis, um, it likely does not, if you did get COVID, your child got COVID, it probably would not increase the risk of getting a more severe condition. Now, the things that are risk factors to either, um, to getting a more severe uh, case of COVID would be if your child is on high dose steroids or significant immunosuppression. You know, so that is children who are early in the course of um, some of our diseases. Um, I think that, uh, you know, most children with arthritis or rheumatic diseases that are on stable therapy should follow the recommendations of their provincial public health guidelines. Um, and those are generally easily available online. Um, the, at the children's hospital or clinic that you go to or uh, the Cassian Friend website have links to those um, to those guidance, and I think that's the most important thing to follow. Um, but I will say I think that um, um, a lot of the kids and families that we are seeing um, 
who are having a lot of stress around the issue of COVID and the potential risk to their child, you know, there's something about this particular condition right now that is just exacerbating an underlying kind of feeling of anxiety. So if a child had a bit of anxiety before this all started, you know, this kind of situation, being away from friends, out of activities, um, uh, has really exacerbated it. And similarly for families. So I think all of us in pediatric rheumatology recognize that this is a very difficult time from a mental health standpoint um, for our patients and families. And, um, you know, we need to pay a little more attention than we already do um, to helping people cope and be connected. Um, because I think there's no um, sugarcoating it. It's very difficult. Yeah. So for our next question, I think, I think I was trying to think of which order to ask it in, but I think I'm going to ask Dr. Tucker first, because you're in clinic doing physical exam and often it would get passed or referred to Dr. Snedden. And then I thought, Kayla, you can weigh in and just tell them from the patient perspective, are you, are you on point or are you way off? So the question is, um, and I think I know just from talking to parents, I've heard so many parents struggle with this is when to know if it's physical. So I hate, I don't even, I'm not even gonna use the word real because I think that's part of the problem, but is it physical? Is it joint? Is it inflammation? Is it pain? And, and then what is the line between that and, and a more emotional, mental pain approach. And, and I know Lori obviously will have clinical measures to identify the, the physical. And then what is the process where you might refer a family to, to that, where it might be a more emotional or mental health issue. Um, and then once you've answered, um, maybe Penny, you can say when you think, where you think the line between physical and mental health is. And then, and then again, Kayla, you can give us the thumbs up or down. <laughs> okay, I know Kayla's judging me, so I think she's doing a good job here. Um, I think first of all, the answer to the question you're asking is very different if we're talking about a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, or a 15-year-old. So I think there's a lot of difference depending on kid's age. And I guess maybe I'll focus on a teenager because I think that's often the more challenging area for, for parents, really. Um, the second thing I wanna say to all the families that are on here that are viewing this, um, there is no question that the pain and distress that you feel as a patient or that your child is feeling is real. There is no question about that. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding because when families or a child are told that this is not active arthritis, that we have to look for other reasons why the pain is happening, the immediate jump is to, they think it's in my head and I'm making it up. And I, I want to assure people that actually, we don't think that way. <laughs> That's not what we're thinking or saying. Um, the pain is real. We just have to work out what the, what the cause is. Now, if you know, we're looking at a teenager with arthritis who's suffering a lot of pain and fatigue and really having trouble functioning, we might do things like blood tests sometimes help. They don't always help. We might try doing something like an MRI to look at the joints and see if there's actual inflammation there or not. Um, and we might try and adjust medications to try and really give maximal medications. Um, but I think that when we, you know, if we get to the point where we say you are having a lot of pain, it's very functionally distressing and disturbing. That's not like sort of like, oh, let's pass you off to Dr. Snedden because, you know, we're kind of done here. That's what we're saying is let's bring Dr. Snedden on to the team so we can work together to work out what the best approach is. And I hope that's a reasonable answer to what you're asking. <laughs> no what? Kayla, thumbs up or thumbs down yet, or do we wait till after? <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is a really tricky one. Um, we know that there is this mind-body relationship that makes it really hard to decipher. And quite frankly, I don't know that it's that productive 
at all times to do that. So, you know, I, I take a very similar approach to Dr. Tucker, all pain is real. And we just have to figure out, you know, what the contributors are to pain, because if we can identify what the contributors are to the pain, then it gives us something to work with as far as how we approach and how we manage the pain. So, you know, as parents, oftentimes what I think the best thing we can start to do is open the door to explore, okay, what are those things that make the pain worse? Because, you know, whether it is like an inflammation issue, we know that stress, we know that anxiety, we know that low mood, we know that sleep deprivation, we know that, you know, not eating, they're all going to have an impact. And so what are those things that make the pain worse? What are those things that seem to bring some relief and comfort? And that's where I focus all those conversations. Because I think one of the worst things is to try to get into the debate about, okay, is it this or is it this? Because what it's going to do is it's one going to make our, our teens, our families feel really invalidated. And, and that's not a good place and not a productive place to work from. And what do you think, Kayla? I, Dr. Snen, you just like took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I agree. I don't think that deciphering between whether it's emotional pain or physical pain is necessarily super productive. Unless of course it's like, you know, lots of inflammation is causing actual joint damage and stuff then of course. But I think that a lot of the time trying to figure it out makes the patient feel more invalidated because like you did say, Dr. Tucker, like it's not you just passing them off, but to like a 13 year old or something, that's how it can feel. And, you know, and it's, it's difficult because as a patient, like sometimes we don't even know what's causing the pain, right? Like I'm 22 and I still sometimes wake up in a lot of pain. I'm like, well, is it because I'm stressed out and anxious right now? Or is it because inflammation, right? And so it's, yeah, I, I'd say just kind of why not just err on the side of caught on the side of caution and say that it's both why not just like take a break and snuggle up with your favorite blanket and watch a movie to help the emotional pain and then also have like a nice heating bag on your knees or something to help with the physical pain like there's no problem with kind of treating it as both in my mind anyways <laughs> the only tricky thing i think is that um you know, I hope this conversation opens the door to people understanding that those modalities are actually treatment, because I think that families um, sometimes come to us um, and, and become angry or disheartened because what they really want is a biologic shot <laughs> that is going to fix the problem. And then it becomes challenging when, you know, we have to say, well, actually, you know, the biologic shot might take care of some of things, but right now that's not what's going to fix the problem. And that's where kind of seeing um, uh, psychology or occupational therapy or whatever other therapies are required, bringing them in to be part of things is, you know, hopefully people can see them as a positive, not as a, you know, we're just, you know, saying uh, it's not, you know, that it's in your head because, I mean, the fact is we don't want to treat emotional pain with immunosuppressive medications that have side effects. That's, that's not safe for anybody. Um, and so um, hopefully people will start to understand that. And it, it's a tricky um, thing to work out. And I think, I think I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit too. I think that's when it comes into play that, that, you know, when a referral comes to psychology at the hospital, we're working really closely with the rheumatology team too, to make sure that we're all kind of doing our parts in assessing and making sure that we're providing all the effective treatments, whether it's medication or more on the medical end, or whether it's more of those mind body strategies. And it's usually quite frankly, a combination. Yeah. I think at everything that um, all three of you have contributed, and I just want to thank you so much for, for being speakers and as well as contributing um, Dr. Tucker in the Q&A is just how important um, the team approach is. And that team includes the youth who is directly affected. It includes 
your healthcare team and all of the members of that healthcare team from therapists to physicians to the nurses, as well as those um, complementary to that team, like, like Dr. Sneddon or counseling psychology and really working together to make sure all those voices and priorities are heard and finding the best outcome. And I think that is ultimately what will really help um, youth like Kayla, who um, thank you again for sharing your story, really just find the best pass forward um, to knowing that um, whether that be juvenile arthritis, JDM, CRMO, and I know we have so many families affected by different rheumatic diseases, that just, it is one part of, of, that, of that youth and that person that they are, but never um, the defining or limiting factor of who they want to be, can be, and should be. Um, that is really, um, you know, their own essence and, and, and is not determined by their chronic disease. Um, and I think just also so important to, I think we'll just remind everyone and what I heard was that depression and anxiety do not cause juvenile arthritis or rheumatic disease and counseling and psychotherapy will not cure juvenile arthritis, but, but these are all things and pieces that can help on the full journey. And so I just want to thank everyone so much again. Um, I, the good indication of how important this conversation is, is the fact that we've actually gone an hour and a half. It is almost seven o'clock. Um, I just want to actually recognize one family today um, that in the chat uh, had their first Humira shot today. And, and mm -hmm. there are so many questions around needle phobia and, and all of those issues. And I just want to let you know that we are going to address those specifically in follow-up. Um, after this session, but also um, I'm going to mention in a few minutes um, some future sessions we have coming up in 2021 where, where those um, specific strategies around needle phobia and some of those issues will be addressed as well. So today we are out of time. So I just want to say thank you again so much, Kayla, um, for sharing your story. Thank you so much, Dr. Sneddon and Dr. Tucker for sharing your expertise. And um, this community just really wouldn't be what it is without all of us coming here together today to share all these perspectives. So thank you again very, very much. Um, I'm just gonna close with a few words. So as I mentioned, um, we have some really exciting things coming up for 2021. Um, so right after this event, you're gonna receive an email. Um, your survey, your feedback on this session is so important, especially as we begin, begin to plan our sessions through 2021. And you can see here on the screen, physical activity will be in January, nutrition in February, and methotrexate, which is really where we will be getting into some of the needle phobia issues and strategy as well um, in March. So uh, we will follow up soon with uh, any questions we didn't get to. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just gonna go to the next slide. So again, we really encourage you to keep that conversation going. Our, our online support network is an amazing place to talk about all these kind of issues um, and really hear from other families about what they experienced. And that feeling of not being alone cannot be underestimated in your mental health journey and that of your child is, is just knowing there are other people out there going through these challenges um, and thriving through them. So please do go to our website. Uh, and join the online support network. One last thank you to our sponsors, Nicola Wealth, Avi, Amgen Roche, and Sobi. We um, could not do this without you. Your support has been so important. Uh, thank you so much again. Um, lastly, we're at the end of 2020. It's been a challenging year for sure, no doubt. Um, but at the end of this year, I actually feel that our community is closer than ever to one another. And um, through things like virtual education or online support network, we've been able to bring this community right across Canada together, not only to each other, but to expert information, um, experts like Dr. Sneddon, et cetera. And we wanna keep doing that into 2021 uh, and well beyond, as, as well as um, putting significant funds into the research that will ultimately achieve our vision of a pain-free future for all kids with rheumatic disease. So if you are able, uh, we would so appreciate your support um, by making a donation today at cassiumfriends.ca forward slash donate. 
And lastly, please keep in touch. The holidays, we're all looking forward to a break, um, but uh, obviously we've talked about opportunities to keep in touch with each other. And also if you have any questions we didn't get to today, if you have ideas for future events um, or just wanna join our community as a volunteer or supporter, please do contact us directly. Um, again, my name is Jennifer. You can reach me at jennifer at cassieandfriends.ca. And I just want to wish everyone um, a good evening and um, just a wonderful holiday uh, season. So thank you so much again for joining us and we will be back in 2021.